It's interesting. I, I had a dream. This was probably about eight years ago now. And in my dream, I saw a whole city shut down, like the power was shut down. It was like the power was going out grid by grid. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, a power surge is coming to the Northwest. I heard it as clear as day. But my, my mind was confused. My spirit was catching something, but my mind was confused. And I said, Lord, I don't understand. If there's a power surge, why is the power going out? And he said, because when my power comes in, all other power shuts down. And so ever since that dream, I have been contending in faith and dreaming about a power surge where we don't have to lay hands on anybody. They come in the doors and whatever was oppressing them has to flee. Whatever was controlling them or, or uh, whatever addiction that they were under has to just flee because the power of God is so strong and so powerful. So one of, the, we believe, the strategies the Lord's given us for right now is a corporate unity. Because how many of you know that with corporate unity, there's a commanded blessing? There's actually a greater anointing that's poured out when we're all in agreement and worshiping together. And so, um, like in the back, you know, we... We, and we love community. That's why we're doing potlucks. That's why we were, you know, building small groups. We love community. We love family. We love the connections. This is the heart Ben and I carry, our team carries. But when we come to worship Jesus on a Sunday morning, we're asking that we all worship, which means that back area, we're going to actually protect that area for worship now. So there won't, we, if, if someone's talking, we're going to ask them to go out in the lobby. And it's not because we want to be mean or stop the connection. We're just, what we're doing is we're protecting an encounter. We're protecting an encounter. We're protecting an atmosphere of, of greater anointing through a corporate unity. So are you guys with us on this? Because I, I feel so strongly that if we pursue this together as a church body, we are going to see power like we've never experienced before. And I'm ready. Like, <laughs> I'm ready. Um, so today we just wanted to um, spend some time. Oh, go ahead. Do we want to bring up? Uh... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We've got an amazing testimony. We want Michelle to come up. Real quick. How many of you guys would, would like to just kind of hear from one of our students at, at Immerse and just hear what's happening there? You guys were just, yeah, shout Michelle down as she comes up here, you guys. Let's just yeah, hear, yeah, hear yeah. her on. Yeah, go ahead and stand and, and just. Uh, come on over here, Michelle. What's been going on in your world? with uh, Immerse. By, by the way, you guys, Immerse is, is our school. It's, we spend 10 weeks in romance. Uh, God is better than you think. We spend 10 weeks in, in grace. Uh, what it's easier it's than easier. you think. easier. That's what it was. <laughs> it's easier than you think. And then we spend 10 weeks in design, which, which we're in right now. You're more important than you think. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Michelle, just share whatever's on your heart in regards to what has happened with you so far. So I feel like... So I feel like um, First off, I, I wanted to just qualify myself to go because I had kids and a family. And I just want to say that it is doable. The fact that it's at night and we, it, it just is. So um, if you're questioning it because you are you have kids at home, it's, it is something that parents and families can do. Um, when I went to Immerse, um, I actually was struggling a lot with mental health issues. Uh, to the point where I was really debilitated. Um, I wasn't very functional, actually, um, and wasn't sleeping at night. I would have panic attacks every single night, um, constantly, where I would wake up many, many times. And so when I actually went to Immerse that first night, um, September 11th, um, I remember standing there, and we were told to stand. I couldn't even go to the front. I was having panic, and um, but... It, 
Krista actually said something about like sometimes that um, that's a mess that needs to be worked out, right? And so I, I just let myself release into that. I haven't had a panic attack or anxiety attack since then. Since oh September. Um, so, and then, so the other thing that I would say was a huge thing for me was I had a lot of, I carried a lot of offense towards the church and a lot of hurt from past church and past spiritual abuse. So when I came into Immerse, I didn't really know what to expect, but it began to, the, the Holy Spirit really gently started bringing all of this offense up. And as the offense got dealt with, the more I felt like I belonged. And, um, and it's amazing how much offense can bring separation from being able to have connection in our lives and actually belong. And, um, and he walked me through quite a few years of that. And I'm still walking through it a little bit, but, but it, it's been a huge transformation of just freedom from all of the past spiritual abuse and a safe place to process that as well. So. So good. All right. Stay up here for a second. Um, if you struggle with anxiety or panic attacks, God says he gives grace to the humble. I know it might be a little bit humbling, but can you just wave wave at me if that's something that you're struggling with? Because we want to pray for you and break that off of you right now. If that's you, I just want you to stand up. Can you guys just stand up if that's you? We've got one in the back over here. We've got one here. Over here. Right here. Back there. Okay, come on. See, I love this because it's one. You notice you have one or two people stand. What that does, it's a vulnerability and a vulnerability uh, is courage and vulnerability go together, and it, it makes room for other people to say, you know what, that's me too. Yeah, yeah. But I tell you what, this is your day. Yeah. Michelle, would you just pray over, over these individuals? Holy Spirit, I just thank you that you are the perfecter and finisher of our faith, and I just ask that you would right now, that you would come with your comfort and your, um, Lord, with your with just your peace that surpasses all understanding, and that you would break that right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I ask that this would be a day marked in history, that this would be their story, that the mark on their um, story would be that this was the last day, that this is the last time that this is done and over, and their new season is beginning. And we ask that all in the name of Jesus. Lord, I, Jesus, I just thank you that your, your scriptures say that by your stripes, we are healed. And, and if this is a mental uh, chemical imbalance, I just ask right now that you would restore that even in the name of Jesus right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Can you guys give Michelle a hand? So by, good. By the way, Immerse is just two nights a week. It's on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday night. Starts at 6.30 and ends around 9 o'clock every night or so. Um, if you, It's very affordable. If you even have an inclination, like, I don't know if I can afford to do it or whatever, register for this next year. You can register on the website. Is it Bethesda? Yeah, at BethesdaNW.com. It'll take you to our church center app. So if you're interested, sign up. And it's just been such a beautiful time with, with so many people. Very great time. We've been so impacted by the testimonies that we've decided we're just going to have a testimony every week. Share yeah. with you guys because it's been so amazing. So we hope you'll pray about joining us next year, mm -hmm. starting in September. Yeah. Should we pray? Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you for today. Thank you that this is the day that you've made. We get to rejoice and be glad in it. I thank you that the eyes of our understanding are being enlightened. Thank you that you've given us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a mouth that establishes praise, that silences the enemy. Oh. And we just thank you, Jesus, for an amazing day, an amazing time today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. So May 21st, we're going to be hosting a foster care awareness workshop. And I know just from the way I felt about foster care for many years and just from conversations I've had with other people that immediately we kind of excuse ourselves from that conversation. Um, because let's face it, not everybody can be a foster parent. 
It's just there's families with small kids. There's families, you know, you're older in your years. Um, you're empty nesters. But we have felt for the last few years God laying it specifically on our hearts to step into this realm of the orphans. Um, I love inspiring leaders, but I love inspiring the next generation as well. And we ended up meeting with the two gals from the department this week. And um, to be honest, fostering, Ben came up with a really good terminology for it. There's guts and glory. There's moments where you want to give up, you're tired, you feel alone, you feel isolated in it, and you feel almost like the foster care issue is Goliath, and I'm just a David. And it's, it, can, it can feel overwhelming. And then there's the glory side of it, where you see a little life being transformed right in front of your eyes. And you're seeing this little life realizing that she's important, that he's needed, that he's loved, that he's secure. And, um, I mean, we, we have so many stories that we don't want to get into just of transformation we've seen just in um, the children that we've brought into our home, even with the lives of the parents. Um, and so today we just wanted to chat a little bit about that. And um, I just want to encourage you to not excuse yourself from the conversation, <laughs> but be curious about it. Is that okay? Yeah. Like, like, to be curious about it. And, and um, it's amazing because what the, in this meeting we had with these gals from the state, they are so, they actually called the situation right now in Vancouver. I'm not talking about the state of Washington or nationwide, I'm talking about the city of Vancouver, they call it a crisis. Wow. The city of Vancouver is in a foster care crisis. Wow. That's their wording. And so they, they have these flyers that they created. They're actually going to come on the 21st and chat with us. But they actually have created a flyer with a QR code that you can scan with your phone. But they're new, like, um, I guess you could say motto that they're saying right now is everyone, or you belong, like basically anyone can have a place. Everyone has a place in foster care. It's just determining what that is. It may not be licensed to be a foster parent, but it could be respite care for these kids because the foster parents get, foster parents get tired, right? And they want to, foster parents want to go on vacation too. So there's many, many opportunities for that. Um, so it's, it's interesting because um, Ben and I get a lot, a lot of people that come to us and they say, what is the church doing for the community? We hear this a lot. Yeah, what is, what is Bethesda doing for the community? And the first thing that goes through my, through my mind um, is, okay, well, one, the first phrase that you guys hear me say all the time, church is not a building, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Church is not a building, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So if that's the case, and we're meant to bring heaven to earth, and I'll tell you what we're doing for the community. One is we've created a place, and you guys are part of this, where there's a, and every time each one of you comes in here, there's what I would call a multiplied anointing that's in this place, a place where people can encounter God. So when you're in a place where people can encounter God, this is what happened to Tish and I in 2008. We encountered God in such an extravagant way, all of a sudden, we started wanting to have even more like what we would say healthy family. So what, once, once we encountered God, it was just like healthy family just kind of took over. Like, how, how can we figure out this healthy family thing? And we're just, you know, and we were going through crises. It was the same time when we were being foreclosed on, closed on and all this stuff. Um, but it was something that was draw as we drew close to him, we started to draw close to each other and started trying to figure out how can we create healthy family. Out of that, uh, one of the pastors at the church that we were at said, hey, we have this single parents ministry. We need someone to take it over. 
And by that time, Tisha had just been, um, for whatever reason, the Lord had just orchestrated it, and she was already meeting with like five, three, or three to five single moms. So we dove into this single parents ministry and started creating, because from out of the heart will flow things, right? From out of the heart flows the issues of life. From out of your belly flows rivers of living water. And those live, that, wa- that, that living water, the Holy Spirit, will start to change and impact people in your sphere of influence. So what we're doing for the community is we're creating a place where people can gather and encounter God. Then from that, healthy family starts to take place. Not perfect family. <laughs> Not perfect family, healthy family. And you never have to be perfect to start taking a baby step to, to, to help someone else. All you need to know is just a little bit more. You know a little bit, and you just need to know a little bit more, and you can get someone to go with you on the, on the journey. And then from that, what we've done is we've created a place where it's not just about Tisha and I being the only powerful people in this room. It's about a bunch of powerful people in this room that actually carry the influence of heaven in their life and can, and can actually have a sphere, impact the sphere of influence wherever they go. So for me, for Tisha and I, yes, there's different things that we'll do. Like we heard a beautiful testimony from Anthony on Jesus people, and there's all sorts of other beautiful things. But really, if our main purpose here is to get you so just connected this way and so confident in who you are this way, that this way is just a natural overflow. So then it's not necessarily what, are, what is Bethesda doing for the community. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory, and the, it just spills out in any sphere of influence that you're already involved in. Does that make sense? <laughs> How many, and I'll tell you what, it's way easier, guys, than, than we think. With, for example, with Isaiah, when we call it the COVID blessing, when COVID happened, it got our butts in gear, and we finally got licensed for foster care. Um, And as soon as we got licensed, we got a call within, I think, a week. And they're like, there's this baby in the ICU. Um, Do you guys want to take him? And we said yes to that. Did you know? Here's just one little testimony in this. We don't have it all together. But Christ holds all things together. Mm -hmm. So we're just going in and saying yes and taking a baby step. We don't know what this is exactly going to look like, except we we have some love to give. And and just the things that we've learned throughout our lives so far on our journey with the Lord. We take this baby, and I tell you what, there were so many different negative reports that were thrown at baby Isaiah. From the, do- from the doctors, like, oh, he's, he's going to have this, or there should be this, or we need to check this, this, and this. And, they're, and it's, I love that they're checking out all those things. But you know what we would do? We would declare the opposite. We would begin to call things that are not as though they are. And it actually, it was funny. We'd go back, and the doctors were baffled. Oh, well, I guess he doesn't have that. And they're checking the report again. Oh, he just doesn't have that. And that was just from declaring life over him and declaring the Word of God. The Word of God is pure. But it's impacting and changing lives. And it actually got to the point where now we're, where Braden was up here getting baptized, Isaiah's mom. And, and now we're in a beautiful relationship with Isaiah's mom, Braden. Um, she's, you know, part of our family as well. And it, I feel like the Lord is better than you think. He always does something better <laughs> than what you could ever ask for or hope for. Which leads us to Isaiah 61. It says what? It says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Do you believe that about Jesus? Yes or no? Yes. Do you believe that about Jesus? Yes. That the Spirit of the Lord is upon him because he has anointed you, him? Look inside yourself. <laughs> Who's in you? Christ is in you. So let me offer you this thought. Maybe that same anointing is on your life. Maybe that's why 
Peter's shadow healed people when he walked by. He, I, I'm sure he didn't get the word like, Peter, when you start to walk by people because I'm inside of you, your shadows are going to heal people. <laughs> no, it was called an accidental miracle. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit told me a few, maybe about a month ago or so, or maybe it was a couple of months ago, that you guys, that we are going to be walk, walk basically, there's going to be accidental miracles around your life. How many want an accidental miracle anointing on your life? <laughs> or maybe you accidentally bump into somebody and they happen to have a broken arm and they get healed, and then you end up sharing, telling them that that was Jesus Christ. <laughs> Anyways, you guys, I'm just saying there's, God is better than we think. And one of the ways that we're going to change and transform our region is to do what Jesus did. He did not come to be served, but he came to serve. We are all in full-time ministry. The word ministry actually means servant. And if we can, if our goal is, is like whether you guys, when it comes to the foster care system, if you know that like, Ben, I already know I can't get licensed, that is fine. I, that's totally fine. But will you guys please come on May 21st just for two hours and listen to the heartbeat of what's happening in our region, and see, because the thing is, is like you might know somebody that you could convey what's happening in our region or in the United States, and you might be able to inspire a person to actually take a call to action and start to leave a legacy in someone else's life that goes beyond your life. Yeah, one of the things uh, the gal mentioned this last week was she said she had reached out to about 50 churches, and all of them said no. It was hard to even get in the door to have conversations. I said, well, trust equity. You know what? We're going to help build that relationship. If I say, I know Evan down here, I know Maddie, and they're amazing people, and I tell that, you guys need to get together with them, and they're going to, maybe they're contractors, they're going to fix your roof, or whatever the case is. There's instant trust equity, right? Not because of, you don't know anything really about them, except that you know me. Yeah, it's Anyways, good. Get, it's, no, it's here. good. So, Isaiah 61. So, actually, I would like you guys to open your Bibles to Luke 4.18. Because this is an echo of Isaiah 61. It's when Jesus sat down in the temple. Actually, he opened up the scroll and read this, and then he sat down. And Luke 4.18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So Jesus came for the poor, the brokenhearted, the blind, the captives, the ones who knew how much they needed him. How many of you have been preached the gospel by Jesus? How many of you have been set free by Jesus? Okay. So once that's happened, you understand the next phase of Isaiah 61, which is he then makes a great exchange with us, and he gives us beauty for the dead things in our life, right? He gives us um, a crown of beauty for those ashes. He gives us the oil of joy for mourning, the things that we were grieving and mourning in our life. The Lord says, actually, I'm going to take that from you, and I'm going to pour joy over you. He takes our heaviness, right, and he gives us a garment of praise. And then the next phase of Isaiah 61 is, and they will go and rebuild the ruined cities. So there's this progression where we're touched by Jesus, we're set free by him, we're healed by him. Then we start to realize, oh, wow, all those dead things are now beautiful in my life. Wow, I have joy in the midst of what could be very, a lot of grief. Wow, I have, I want to praise even when I feel heavy. Amen? And then all of a sudden, wow, 
I have something to give. Those, those things, those desolate places that I see around me at my work, that I see around me in this restaurant that I'm going to, the peop, these desolate places where people are so hopeless and heartbroken, wow, I can rebuild them with the same gospel that saved me. It's in our DNA now to be rebuilders of the ruins. It's actually anti-new creature to not go into a, a place of desolation and, and say, Lord, help me rebuild this. You remember Nehemiah? Nehemiah is serving an evil king, and this guy is full of joy all the time because one day he comes in sad because he heard about the walls that had crumbled <laughs> in, in his hometown around the temple. And this king, who's not even a believer, not even an Israelite, not a children of God, not a child of God, and he says, Nehemiah, why are you so sad? Because Nehemiah was a joy bomb. He was a walking joy bomb. You know what Nehemiah 9 says? It says, that, uh, stop being so sad. Jo the joy of the Lord is your strength and stronghold. That's in Nehemiah. Nehemiah understood joy. And now the king is funding. He's saying to Nehemiah, you know what? Take all my, take resources that I have and go and rebuild this wall. See, it's our new nature to rebuild the desolate places. It's not our nature to see something that's broken down and desolate and go, well, Jesus, I hope you come back soon. <laughs> that's not our new nature. In fact, in Acts 3, 21... I want to go there because I feel like we need to read this together. Acts 3.21, Peter is preaching, and he says this, For he, Jesus, must remain in heaven until the restoration of all things has taken place. We're not waiting for Jesus to come back. He's waiting for the restoration. He's waiting for his rebuilders to rise up. And take the desolate places with power and authority and love. You are a rebuilder of the ruins. Now, if it, I understand we all have days. I understand I, some days I wake up, a couple weeks. I even said this to, at the foster care meeting with these two gals. I said, can I be honest with you? Two weeks ago, I wanted to quit. Because it's a broken system. And I felt super overwhelmed. I felt so powerless. But there's something about when you come into that place where you go, okay, Jesus, I have nothing in me. I don't have enough power in me, but you have the power. You are my personal bravery. <laughs> Habakkuk. Habakkuk says this. You are my personal bravery so I can take those places of suffering that are my responsibility and actually step into them with authority because I have the living God inside of me. It's not Tish's strength or Tish's power or Tish's anointing. It's the anointing of Jesus that I'm surrendering to, to not stand still or back up, but to keep walking forward no matter what is going on. And so I understand you ha we have these moments where we don't feel like rebuilders of the ruins. But what do we do? We go back to beauty. We go back to joy. We go back to praise. And what, where does that lead us? It leads us back to the anointed one who set us free. It takes us back to that place, that first love, where we encountered him and he came in and he rescued me out of my prison cell of sin and said, Tisha, you're free. Isaiah 61 is a flow from heaven. <laughs> and when we forget who we are, when we say, oh no, I can't, I can't do that, I'm too overwhelmed with this, wait a second. Jesus, you crowned me with beauty. You gave me the garment of praise. You gave me joy that's my strength and stronghold. Jesus, you are my anointed one. <laughs> Ooh, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> You know what it says in Ephesians 5? It says, be imitators of God. 
And this is how we know that you're children. Sometimes you, you know, that word in the Greek is mimic. Sometimes when you don't know what to do or you don't feel like God's in you, just do what he would do. <laughs> you know, the bracelet, what would Jesus do? Say what he would say. It's, it's, it's imitating God. And, and there's this beautiful thing I read the other day about how, you know, in the, rab, the rabbis in the Jewish culture, they would actually learn, the disciples would learn from the rabbis by literally mimicking whatever the rabbi would do, which is hilarious because if the rabbi had any kind of like weird, like nervous tics or like... Let me try. I'm just going <laughs> to do whatever you're doing. <laughs> scratch their head. You know, all the disciples behind him are doing the same thing, literally. And so uh, there was this writing I, I read, and it was basically, it was imagine a rabbi who, with 12 disciples who heals the sick, casts out demons, is hung on a cross and dies. Who do you think of? Jesus. But that was actually Paul too. Paul had learned so clearly how to imitate God. And Paul didn't even have Jesus to follow around and mimic and do all these things. But Paul's life was a, was a complete image of Jesus because he had learned how to imitate God. This is what I'm yearning for for my own life. It's like, I don't want to just go to church. I don't want to just say I'm a Christian. I want to take in the widows and the orphans. I want to change the world one person at a time. I'm not interested in making big buildings. I know Pastor Bill Johnson says this. I'm interested in, in making big people. Because, you guys, there is a crisis in this realm. And there is a group of people that are stepping in to take these kids. And it's not the church. And if we want to rescue these children from being groomed, stepping into gender confusion, stepping into identity issues, the church is going to have to do something. Because this is our future generation. You know, thank you. <clears throat> I have people that will, you know, I'm a big uh, proponent for women in ministry, obviously. <laughs> I'm up here with a microphone leading a church. Come on, um, girl. I have people that say to me, why do you have to defend yourself? Stop defending yourself. Just let your life, I'm like, no, no, wait, wait. I'm not defending myself. I'm preparing the way for my daughters yeah. and my granddaughters and my great-granddaughters. Yeah. This is not about me. I could care less if you get offended with me up here with the microphone preaching and leading. Care less. Because I'm doing this out of obedience to Jesus. But I do care about the future generations. Because I want to leave a legacy. This is not just about me right now in this moment. See, that's temporal. It's about what legacy am I leaving? Amen. Thank yeah. you, Jesus. You know, so good. I, Tish and I, I think, it, well, it, in this last 10 days, we've gotten four reach outs to take kids. Can you take this kid? Can you take this kid? Can you take this kid? Here's the situation. This is the baby. Can you, some are babies. Some are toddlers. Some are, you know... Um, we're licensed. Our particular license goes from, I think, zero to eight now or something like that. Four in, ten, in the last 10 days. And you know what our heart says every time? Yes, we want to take that baby. That kid. But at the same time, we realize we are already committed to two other, well, actually three other people. We have our beautiful daughter, almost five. We have our godson and his wonderful mom and friend, Isaiah and Brayden. And we want to be in it for sustainability. 
sustainable generosity. So we're thinking, okay, well, maybe we can get just 30 people involved from Bethesda in our region. When I told the social workers just 30, their eyes went, you know, like, you know, I'm like, if we get 10, if we get five, but I just want to encourage you guys on May 21st, if you can just spend, invest two hours of your time and just hear what they have to say, hear from some other foster parents that are going to be in the room and just, we're just going to talk, be really raw and real about all of it and also give options on how we can be a servant in our region and see kids' lives transform. The culture that's in your heart be released and, and placed in the culture of, of these, these little kids. Why not capture a generation now? And I just want to say this. You know, I was just getting the picture of the virgins with the, with the lamp and the oils burning. And, and then the ones that just didn't have the oil in their lamp. And may, maybe, just maybe, the thing... Well, let's see. Let me. How, how do I say this? I'll save that for another time. But I just want to say this. Maybe the boredom that you're experiencing, the in, the things that you think that are inconvenient, the all the problems that you see you're facing. Maybe if you just get involved in something like the foster care system and serving. Maybe that would all of a sudden, a grace would start pouring into your life. Thank you, Lord. And maybe that would be just the shift that you need that you didn't even know that you needed. And I want to say that you shine more brightly than you think you do. You have the oil burning in the lamp. And that oil, and that you are a city set on a hill that it cannot be hidden. And I just want to see our region and these kids... I just want to see a legacy left here. Um, but we can't do that without you. We, we can bring people in. We can't take every kid. But, boy, it would sure be great to have a bunch of you guys in that room um, that might just get more informed, that we could just start to impact this region uh, around us and change uh, lives in a way. And it could, it'll actually change your life, too. Our life has been so touched and so changed by this. We've just learned yeah, so I much. Yeah, I just want to share real quick about just a quick testi testimony about our daughter that we have right now placement of. And when she came to us, she raged. She would fall on the ground, scream, because she didn't have any security in her life. Every, her, whole, her whole security had been just ripped out of her hands. And so we just started, like, I mean, yes, we have some parenting skills, right? We've raised three of our own. But we just started releasing the kingdom over her. Like, she, she, she couldn't sleep at night. She'd struggle to sleep. I mean, her whole world was just a, a chaos. And we brought in worship. We brought in prayer. We brought in hugs and snuggles. And I can tell you today, like, she, every night before bed, she goes to sleep to the love note from upper room, you know. She's, she's going to sleep to that. I love you in the morning, in the noontime, in the evening, you know. She's being saturated in the presence of Jesus. And it's changing her life. She's being transformed <laughs> from the inside out. And it's just beautiful to witness. Like yesterday, she said to me, oh gosh, 20 times probably, I love you, mama. I love you, mama. I love you, mama. And I'd say, I love you too, baby girl. I love you so much. You know, um, we can't talk about her specific case because we're just not allowed to. But I can tell you there's been some unrest over the past couple months, and she feels that. And, you know, the other day I was doing her hair, and she said, Mama, can I have your phone number so I can find you if I need to find you? I said, Honey, I will let, we'll, we'll get my phone number memorized. You will know my number. I said, but, but beyond that, honey, I want you to know that no matter what happens, you have a mommy. You have a daddy. <laughs> Always. You always have Mama Tisha and Daddy Ben. Whatever happens in your life. So I just want to say, like, this is a call to become the rebuilders of this region. But it's also a call for the mothers and fathers to please stand up. 
to stand up and take that place as spiritual mothers and fathers, not just, to foster, not just foster care. This is one facet of Bethesda. But there are people all around us that just need a mom. They just need a dad. They need someone to believe in them. They need someone to pray for them. They need someone to help them, like just wisdom, practical wisdom. So would you guys please stand with, with us? I also feel that the, or there's people that'll be watching this or maybe you're in the room right now and you're like, man, I hear what you guys are saying, but for some reason I just don't feel that passion or desire, not only for that, but maybe just for, for anything. And I, I want to say right now is your moment. The Holy Spirit is going to dip. I got this vision one time of, of G, the hands of Jesus in dipping this heart, this dirty, broken, bruised, tattered heart, hurt heart, and dipping this heart into this crystal clear river. And so gently pulling all that stuff off and healing that heart and pulling that heart back up. And I just heard the words that I'm purifying the hearts of man. I'm purifying my bride. I just want to say his word is pure. He's healing your heart right now. And he's setting your heart ablaze for him. And so we just thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for each person here and the beautiful calling that is on their life and that they're not just human doings. We're not just doing stuff. But we're human beings, yes. and we live and move and have our being in you. So I just thank you for every person here. Thank you for listening to us, you guys. And uh, we just bless you in the name of Jesus. And let's enjoy our potluck after this. <laughs> <laughs> say this. Say, I am, I am a rebuilder, rebuilder of the ruins. Of the ruins. Amen. <laughs>